Join with me in a word of prayer before we dig into God's word. Father God, we ask that your spirit would lead us and would teach us this morning. Father, as we open up your word, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive. You would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, Father God, and change our hearts so we could apply your word to our life. It is in your amazing name we pray, amen. So, welcome to Frosty Hollywood Community Church this morning. It is cold. I don't care what my wife says. Uh, No, but we are starting a new series, and we're excited about it. It's called The Last 24. And Now, how many of you in here this morning have ever seen the show 24? Anybody seen that with Jack Bauer? Okay, this was a much better response this morning than yesterday. Yesterday at the Saturday Food Pantry First, I asked people, who's heard of 24 and Jack Bauer? Two people out of the whole entire service. So um, one of the things that I used, I used to watch 24 before they took it off the air. And one of the favorite parts is I loved that show, every part of it. I would tell Kelly that I would want to be Jack Bauer for Halloween. And every year she told me, no, you can't be Jack Bauer. Um, I hate that guy. Would you please stop talking about Jack Bauer. And I would tell her, Kelly, you don't understand that there is freedom in America right now because of Jack Bauer. Like, you have to understand that. He goes around and he stops terrorist attacks. Like, this man is brutal, he's vicious, but he gets the job done. And one of my favorite things that I would always get from that show is every time it would happen, it seemed like it was every episode, but if you're sitting back saying, Brad, I have no idea what the show 24, hour, 24 is, what, what's the deal? Here's what it was. It was basically some kind of terrorist attack in some form or fashion was going to happen within 24 hours. So each episode, it was one hour long, and it would progress the story for this next 24 hours. Y'all with me? So each time, and it was like, what's going to happen this episode? And then it would like clock down, like, dang, 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 and it would show, okay, What's Jack going to do? And so each episode, he's trying to get further and further to stop this terrorist attack from happening. Well, every time something would happen, he would go into a situation. There would be like 100 enemies out there in in the front. And the people on the other side of the phone at CTU is what it was called, the headquarters. They would say, Jack, we need you to come back into the office. Don't go in. I'm done talking. He'd hang up and he'd rush right into the battle. He'd come across a hundred men. You're sitting there like, he's gonna die. What's gonna happen? You almost have a heart attack and then you see Jack comes through and he's alive for the next episode. And it goes all the way through to the end. And when you finally get to the end of the show, he stops the terrorist attack and then it's like, yes, it's finally done and over. And then the last episode of the season, he gets captured by some other country and it's like, no, Jack, no. I now have to go through all those nerves again. But what happens is, is in those moments when Jack said, I'm not going to come back to the headquarters, I'm going to stay the course, here's what's happening. He, in that show, Jack Bauer only had 24 hours to go stop something deadly that was happening. And he could only do what was necessary to accomplish that task. And so if there was something, going back to CTU, the headquarters, would have taken time away from what was most important to him and his priority. Well, in Jesus' last 24 hours of his life on earth, Everything Jesus did, he, was made, he made sure that it was on purpose and intentional. His last 24 hours, he didn't have time to waste because what he was about to do through his death, burial, and his resurrection was bring new life. So whatever, uh, whatever pertained to reaching that goal is what he put a priority on. And so these events that we're going to look at these next few weeks This is how all these events take place so that Jesus could usher in the new kingdom. He would make all things new. There would be new life, new creation, a new covenant, and they all began with these last 24 hours. Are you with me this morning? Following me? And so we're going to be in Mark chapter 14 this morning. We're going to look at the first event called the Last Supper. And as I sat back, I started to read and think, okay, why did Jesus do the Last Supper as part of his last 24 hours. What was the point behind it? And not only that, why did he do the Lord's Supper with the 12 individuals that were sitting around his table? If you only had 24 hours to live, why this supper for Jesus? Why these men that were around his table? So we're gonna start in verse 12, and it says this in Mark chapter 14. And on the first day of unleavened bread, When they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go 
and prepare for you to eat the Passover. And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went into the city and found it just as he had told told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it, is, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank all of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so as we sit back and reflect on this sequence of events, why this supper? Why these men? Why these people? I put it in your notes this way. I put the first thing in your notes. It says this. He recognized the importance of who was at his table. And in the first few verses of this passage, in in 12 through 16, Jesus was super intentional about who was going to join him at this supper, who was going to be around his table. And if you look in these verses, you go back to it, you can see that Jesus was super intentional, that the the Jews regularly celebrated the Passover. And they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, where are we going to celebrate the Passover meal? Where is this going to happen? And if you look at Jesus' response, he says, look, You're going to go into the city, you're going to find a man with a jar, and when you tell the man with the jar, hey, my teacher wants us to go to the room, he's going to tell you where to go, and you're going to go into the room, and you're going to find it already prepared and arranged for you, and then all you need to do is prepare the Passover meal there. And so as you look at this, you sit back, and it's Jesus knew that he was going to meet with this man for a reason. And he was so intentional about it that he had this room set up ahead of time because he needed to meet with these men. And so as I sat back and I began to study through this, I began to think, why did Jesus become so intentional with these men? You have to remember, these were the men that Jesus did life with. These were the men that he would go out and Jesus would perform miracle after miracle. These disciples were in the middle of a storm, saw that they were about to die and they were crying out, they're trying to get it, and Jesus wakes up and says, peace, be still, and the seas calmed. This is the same guy that they saw walk on the water out to them in the boat. They saw Jesus take lame people who couldn't walk, heal them just by speaking it. They get up, they run, they hop, they skip, they jump, they celebrate, and they saw Jesus do this. They saw Jesus with thousands of people in front of him, coming to listening about the kingdom of God, and he saw him take just a few bread and a few fish and multiply and miraculously feed everybody till there was an abundance left. They saw Jesus take a man whose hand was full of leprosy and healed the leprosy. They saw Jesus take their dear friend Lazarus, who was dead in the tomb, and raise him from the dead. And then Jesus looks at him and says, disciples, what you've seen me do, preaching the kingdom, telling people, turn from your ways, Turn to God, I'm going to send you out, and you're going to do the same thing. These men go out, and they begin to preach the gospel of the kingdom, and they begin to cast out demons, they begin to heal people, they begin to see God do a work in people's lives, and they come back and they say, Jesus, you won't believe what happened. The demons were cast out, these miracles happened, people turned and they followed the kingdom, and Jesus said, yes, because you were operating under my authority, and I tell you, my disciples, you will do greater things than I have done. And so these 12 men were the ones that were influential in Jesus' life, and he was influential in their life. You see, Jesus knew that these 12 men were going to change the world. You see, all of us in here today that profess faith in Jesus Christ understand that it began with these disciples. 
that when Jesus returned to heaven to be with his father, these men took on preaching the gospel and the good news to where that good news has made it into your life. So these men that Jesus met with, these were his friends. This was Jesus' squad, as we like to say nowadays. These were the men that he was doing life with that would pray for him, that would encourage him. Remember, when Lazarus died, Jesus wept. His disciples were there. They were praying for him. They would encourage him. And when he goes through and takes him to the garden, he brings his disciples with him and says, would you pray for me while I'm praying? And Jesus teaches us something important in our life. You see, Jesus called for this most important time in his life. He called these disciples around his table. And in our lives, who is around your table? If I had, if this table right here were set up with the Lord's Supper, and in your own personal life, who do you have that speaks into your life around your table? Who do you have that you sit with that when there's, issues and struggles and things in your life, who is your sounding board? Who are the ones that you're receiving counsel from? Who are the ones you're receiving advice from? Because who is at your table influences your life. Does it not? You see, I had a friend of mine tell me the other day, he said, he goes, Brad, he goes, I wish I lived next to you, near you, because he lives in Texas. And I was like, that's kind of weird, why? And Because uh, we joke like that, that's a normal conversation. He's like, well, he's like, here's the deal. My wife and I, we need godly influences in our life, and I think it would be good if we lived near you. And I said, well, here's a question. I said, are you guys connected into a church? Immediately he said, no, we're not. And he's like, I have no godly influence in my life. And I had to use it as a moment to tell him. It's like, look, your, your marriage is struggling, your marriage is in turmoil, because the people around your table are not Christians, it's people from the world. And the advice that the world gives is not, is not one that brings life. The advice he's getting from the world is saying, just leave your wife, she's crazy, just leave her. And he's sitting there struggling in his life because he's not connected to godly influences in his life. His table is empty. You see, and Jesus teaches us this importance because God is calling each of us to have people at our tables that will speak life, that will speak truth. Because at times in our life, we need other believers who will say, Brad, your anger is a problem right now. Like the way you acted and responded is not the proper response. And we need people who are going to speak that life into us. We need people around our table that are gonna push us to pursue God's plan and mission for a life, because the reality is this, is that God, if God has saved your soul, and you say, Jesus is my savior, I put my faith in him, then Jesus desires to use you to build his kingdom, that he has a plan for your life, that he has people that he wants you to influence, that he wants you to share the gospel with, and you're gonna need people in your life to push you to do that, because does anybody in here sit back and say, the Christian life is easy? I don't see a single hand across this room because this, the enemy, catch this, we have an enemy who knows how much God wants to use you to impact the kingdom. He knows the good news that you have inside of your heart that has changed you and saved you. He knows that God wants you to share that. And if he can distract you from sharing that message, that message doesn't go forth. And people stay broken. People stay caught in idolatry. People stay lost. People stay hurting. And so you need people in your life who are gonna say, look, I know you're struggling right now. I know you feel tired, but Jesus needs to use you. I can pray for you. Let's, let's get on our knees because you gotta chase God's calling in your life. But if you look at your table and it's empty, or if the people around your table are all of the world, is it no wonder you're not living on mission for God? And the biggest struggle for so many people that I hear so many times is I just can't, I just, I don't have that fire for God in me right now. I'm just going through this season where I'm down and it's like, well, are you connected to other believers who are pushing you and encouraging? No, I'm not. But I can live as a Christian on my own. I can listen to the radio. I can watch TV. Are you connected to the body? No, I'm not. Well, then how do you expect 
to live on mission for God when there's no one around your table who is pushing you to be all that God wants you to be. And the other side of that table is the people around your table, God is asking you, because he tells each of us, the Great Commission says, go therefore and do what? Make disciples by preaching the gospel, right? So around our table, we have the responsibility to make disciples. And so as you look at your table, is that the mission that you're on with those that sit around your table? Is that the people around there? Are you trying to push them? Are you trying to share your faith with those around your table? Because, see, that's the responsibility that Jesus took on with his disciples. And he was intentional with them because he knew these men would do great things by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I had a wise pastor tell us one time that in our life, Everybody needs to have elevator friends. You might sit back and say, well, what does that mean, elevator friends? It's that the people around your table are the ones that are going to elevate you, to encourage you, to lift you up, not bring you down. They're going to push you towards Christ, push you up towards him, to praise him, to worship him, to glorify him, to honor him, and they're not going to be the ones that bring you down. And there are times in my life when I didn't have elevator friends in my life. There was a period of time when I decided to have all the people at my table were people from the world and people who didn't know God. And there's a verse in the Bible that says, bad company corrupts good character, right? And so I was like, well, I'm a Christian, I'm doing things, I won't, I won't fall in. The first time I hung out with them, everything was cool, nothing happened. Next time I hung out with another bride, hey, you just want to have a little drink? I'm like, ah, I don't drink, I don't do that thing. Well, just come on, come on, come on, come on. So I had a little sip, hung out with them again, and then before I knew it, I was drinking on the weekends, getting drunk, plastered, all of that stuff. And you want to know how it started? It's because the people at my table were not pushing me towards God. They were from the world. And before I knew it, I had to have God get a hold of me and say, Brad, this is not what I want from your life and what I want from you. You need to change who's around your table. And I had to make a difficult decision. I had to cut people out of my life. I had to say, I'm not going to call them. I'm not going to text them. When they call and text me, I'm not doing nothing because I can't handle it. They're not pushing me to Jesus. I'm falling away. I need to surround myself with people that will push me towards Christ. And so I made a decision that the people I'm going to put around my table are the ones that are going to push me towards Christ. I have a few friends of mine that I call an old roommate from college and an old pastor friend who taught me how to get into ministry. And he was the children's pastor here before, and he's been a huge mentor in my life. And when things get difficult, when I need counsel, when I get wisdom, I'm calling people who are going to push me towards Christ to remind me of my calling and say, Brad, even though it gets hard, even though it gets difficult, keep pursuing Keep pushing, keep loving, keep doing what God has called you to do. These are the people that you need around your table. Are you with me this morning? And when you look at his table, there's some part that can get easily crossed over is you might sit back and you're going to have people around your table that are going to do life with you, and in moments, some of those people might betray you. And how do you handle it? See, in the story, Jesus had one of those people sitting at his table, tells him, one of you will betray me. And what's interesting is, how did Jesus handle that? See, just before they take this Lord's Supper, and another verse, and we'll get there in a minute, Jesus gets down and he washes all of his disciples' feet. And two of the feet that Jesus washed were Judas's. And when you look at what Jesus says about Judas, would you look with me in verse 21? He says, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. A lot of times you can look at that verse and you can sit there and read it and say, this is Jesus condemning Judas. This is Jesus pointing the finger saying, you should have never been born. Woe to you, Judas. How dare you betray me, Jesus of the world, the Savior of the world. 
But really, the tension behind those words is this. It was words of compassion and sorrow. Because Jesus knew the guilt and the shame and the pain that Judas was going to bring into his life the moment he betrayed Jesus. And so when he says, man, it would be better if this man were never born, Jesus is sitting there saying, I know what he is about to go through. I know the pain that he's about to endure. And what happens to Judas? Betrays Jesus, realizes his mistake, tries to make it right, says, Pharisees, take the money back. I don't want to do it anymore. Like, deal's over. They're like, no, keep your money. And Judas, overcome with guilt and shame, went out and hung himself. And how did Jesus respond to that? He washed Judas' feet. And so Jesus gives us an important thing for us in our lives as the people around our table is even if they have a moment of betrayal, it is our responsibility to love them. Jesus said, look, you need to pray. I know what the world says. The world says when somebody betrays you, get rid of them, cast them aside, talk about gossip, put it all over social media, put it on Instagram, tell what a horrible person they are, and let everybody know how bad they are. But Jesus says, look, when somebody betrays you, love them. Pray for your enemies. Because God's love is different than the way that the world loves. Because at the end of the day, we can point a finger at Judas and say, how dare he? But all of us at some point in our life have betrayed Jesus ourselves. We've all turned to our own ways. We've all chased after idols. And all of us have done things that brought dishonor to God. And so even when you find somebody around your table who will betray you, the answer is never respond in anger, never respond out of turn. The response is always love. Here's the second thing I put in my notes. Not only did he recognize the importance of who was at his table, he also reminds his disciples of their mission. And if you would, turn with me to John chapter 13. Because a lot of times when we look at the Lord's Supper, we look at the elements, we look at the bread, we look at the wine, and we spend time on that. But in this Last Supper, there was more going on than just the bread and what the the wine represented. That Jesus was using this as a very intentional moment to instill vision into his disciples, to inspire them, to encourage them, to remind them why he said to them in the first place, follow me. John 13, 1, 1 through 5 says this, now before the feast of that Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he, had, that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. In this example, Jesus wanted to remind his disciples of what their life from this moment on would look like. You see, washing someone's feet was the most menial task that was usually delegated to a slave or a servant. That people were like, my feet are so nasty, I got crusty toes, I'm not willing to wash them myself, I'm gonna have somebody else wash my crusty toes. And Jesus sat back and said, I'm gonna do the job that is most disgusting I mean, have you ever washed someone else's foot besides, like, your child or a spouse or a family member? Like, have you ever took someone else's foot and put your fingers between their toes and cleaned them? That is a super intimate moment, is it not? And Jesus sat back and said, look, I want... At this dinner, we're going to take the Passover. We're going to do that. But before we do that, I want to give you guys something. I want to teach you that what real love looks like, what God's love looks like, it looks like me, the king of the universe, 
the savior of the world, the one who created everything. What love looks like is me getting down, washing your dirty, messy feet. And if you read on in that passage, you could see where Simon Peter's like, you're not washing my feet, we need to wash your feet. And Jesus tells him, look, I need to wash your feet. Because unless I clean you and wash you, how else will you be clean? And what Jesus is saying to Peter is, no, 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 you don't understand. God's love has to wash your feet. It can't happen any other way. That what Jesus was about to do in these last 24 hours, love had to serve. Love had to do what no one else was willing to do. And he tells his disciples this. He says, and look, catch this. I want what I have done to you, I want you to do for each other and for others. Because guess what? A slave is not greater than the master. The servant is not greater than the teacher. And he said, catch this. He said, and as you guys do this, as you love each other, as you serve each other, then the world will truly know that you are my disciples. And so I'm sure you've seen in churches all across the United States, churches you've been to, where the pastor will bring somebody on stage and they'll take their shoes and socks off and they'll wash their feet in front of everybody and they'll say, look, this is what Jesus did for for his disciples and this is what Jesus is asking us to do now. But if we're honest, how many feet are we washing? And here's, here's, here's what I want to get at this morning. Is that washing Jesus' feet, washing other people's feet doesn't always literally mean washing other people's feet. Okay, you with me? What, what, then what does it mean, Brad? Well, here's what it is. Washing other people's feet can look like this. Sitting at a hospital while someone is dying who is all alone. It's washing people's feet. It's weeping with someone who lost a loved one. That's washing feet. It's sharing a meal with someone who has nothing. It's washing feet. It's mentoring young children who have no godly influence in their lives. It's washing feet. It's willing to help clean people's houses with nothing in return. It's helping them get their life together. It's sitting down with someone who's homeless and saying, how can I help you get back on your feet? It's doing things that no one else in the world wants to do, is what washing feet is. It's being kind to the waiter or the waitress who's giving you the worst service ever, not deserving of anything, and you love them. It's washing people's feet does, goes way beyond just literally washing their feet. It's being willing to do for them whatever it takes for them to know God's love, to experience it, and to be known and loved by God. And washing feet is really loving, way, uh, loving others the way that Jesus has loved us. Because if Christ has changed your life, you know he took your dirty, broken life, set you free from idolatry, has made things right in your life, has made you a new creation. All your old things have passed away, right? Behold, all have become new. Why? Because God's love chose to wash your feet and to cleanse you. Mark 14, 22 and 25, if you would look back there with me, says this. And as they were eating, he took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. You see, all the Jews and his disciples at this time knew what the Passover meant. And any time that Jesus took what was done in the old, He always attached new meaning to it by saying, this is me, and I'm going to give new meaning to this Passover meal. And he gives new meaning to it saying, look, God is doing a new thing in the world. God has established a new covenant. And when we take this bread, 
which will be, represent my body. When we take this wine, what will represent my blood, which is going to be poured out for many, this is how God is going to make things new in the world. You see, it's interesting that one of the writers, John, one of the disciples, I'm sorry, in John chapter 1, he begins his book this way. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, when you look at that, in the beginning, it echoes where? Genesis 1, in the beginning. What is John doing? John, is what, what he's saying is, look, there is a new creation that God has done in the world. There's a new covenant, a new way of bringing life that has been done through Jesus Christ. And when we take this Lord's Supper, each and every single time that we take it as a body of believers, we are saying God has acted in a new way. God has established a new creation, a new life that is only found through Jesus Christ. And as he took these elements... This is how God made us new. This is how he was going to give us new life. And it was going to be through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he reminds his disciples that when they take this Lord's Supper, and every time they take it, it is a reminder of God's covenant for his people. That God will always be faithful that God will always love us, that God will always be by our side, and that God will always use us to be on mission for him. And when we take the Lord's Supper, we're gonna do that in just a few moments this morning. The Lord's Supper is always a time of personal reflection. It's always a time where you sit back and say, this is how God has saved me. That Jesus' blood was shed so that many could experience new life. And so it's a personal thing for us, and, and Scripture even tells us that when we take the Lord's Supper, we need to have a moment to examine our life and to say, okay, if there's any unconfessed sin, let me confess it, let me get right with God, and then we take it. So there's personal reflection, there's personal uh, things that we feel, we're like, yes, God, thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice you made for me, but there's also, it's a reminder of our mission. That Jesus is telling them, look, we're going to take this Lord's Supper because my blood is being poured out for the many. And there are still the many that are beyond these four walls. Outside of Hollywood Community Church, there are millions of people who are lost. And so this personal reflection, the Lord's Supper, doesn't end with us. Oh, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Now I can just be all concerned about myself and how you bless me. No, it's always thank you, Jesus, for saving me so I can go out and share this good news to the lost and the hurting and the broken so that the many could come to know Christ as their Savior. You see, he's reminding his disciples of his own mission. What did Jesus tell his disciples? That his mission was here to seek and to save the lost. Everything that Jesus did was to that end, so that people would come back to God and God would make it right in their life. And so taking the Lord's Supper together keeps the mission and the vision before our minds. It encourages us to share the good news. And is it not the best news we could ever share? I know we could sit back and say, oh, well, I could get a two-for-one Big Mac at McDonald's. I could save money on my taxes going to H&R Block, and I'll get 5000 more back. Yes, that's great news. That compares nothing to the fact of the good news, which is Jesus Christ is Lord, and in him is forgiveness of sins. You see, Jesus can make all things new. Have you, seen him experience, have, you, have you seen him make things new in your own life? What, what are some things he can make new? Broken marriages, people addicted to no matter what it is, he could set them free. Does he not say in his word that because things are new through him and his new, God is acting in a new way, the poor will be what? Rich. The last shall be what? The brokenhearted shall receive joy. Mourning will be turned to dancing. Families healed and restored. Wayward sons and daughters will return home to meet their Savior. The hungry will be fed. The widows will be cared for. The orphans would find homes and love through parents who would love the way that God has loved them. Through Christ, the world is being made right. 
And every time we take the Lord's Supper together, we will announce the Lord's death until he comes, saying the best news, the good news, is Jesus Christ is Lord, and if you place your faith in him, you will be set free from idolatry. You will receive forgiveness of sins, and you will be made new. So I'm just going to ask three questions for us to take away this morning. Who's at your table? You might sit back and go, I don't really know if I have anybody at your table. Take the steps today to get godly people around your table. Second question is this, is are you staying on mission with the good news? As we take the Lord's Supper together in a moment, it's a personal reflection, but it's a reminder for us to share that good news. And so sit back and say, how am I doing with sharing the good news with those that don't know God? Begin to take that step and share your faith with them. And the last question is this, is have you ever had a time where you put your faith in Jesus Christ? If you haven't had that time, today is the day to do that. The worship team is going to sing in just a moment when we get ready to uh, take the Lord's Supper. And there will be people up in the front that you could pray with and say, look, I've never placed my faith in Jesus Christ. Today is the day to do that. Because as Jesus promises in his word, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And you will receive forgiveness of sins.